16th chapter of John, we can count four rungs up the ladder to the kingdom of heaven. You might imagine when Jacob was sleeping and his head was on a stone, he had a dream. <coughs> he dreamed that there was a ladder to heaven and the angels ascending and descending on that ladder. Well, think of that. And consider this. That we will take four steps. That in this gospel are four steps by which Christ leads us up to his kingdom. <clears throat> the first step he mentions when he touches upon manna. This is in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant between God and Israel. <clears throat> they had not been in the wilderness more than two and a half months. They had been led out of slavery across the Red Sea not two and a half months before. God had shown them the power of his right hand and his faithfulness to his people by leading them on dry land between the waves of the Red Sea. And all of a sudden they're grumbling, murmuring. This, by the way, is why I like that translation better than the one you have there. Here it says complain. <clears throat> but that word murmuring, in the Old Testament Greek, it's gongismus, which is the sound that pigeons make under a bridge. Gongus, gongusmos. Or you can even imagine those pigeons in some open space in Chicago or New York. You walk and So that's their murmuring. And in a minute you're going to see <coughs> that the people in front of Jesus do exactly the same murmuring. So, not two and a half months after they had seen the love of God, they're murmuring. What? They said, Moses, they said, did you take us out of Egypt so that we would starve in this wilderness? Shoot, they said. We sat by the flesh pots. We ate pretty good stew in Egypt. And we had bread enough to fill ourselves, satisfy ourselves. <coughs> but you took us out here mama, mama, girl, mama, girl, to kill us. Well, Moses took the word unto the Lord God, and God's response was to prove faithfulness by raining down bread from heaven. <clears throat> and they ate that. In the morning, they would pick up enough food to see them through the day, satisfied. On Friday, they picked up two loads so that they would have something to eat also on Saturday. This is the first step in the Old Covenant. Well, moreover, this bread also was consecrated to be eaten on every Passover day. <clears throat> every Passover, matzah, unleavened bread. They did that in Jesus' day. And you notice that this was a Passover time when he talked about being the bread of life. They do it in our day, Pesach, Passover, bread. <clears throat> well, the second rung comes into the New Covenant. <clears throat> it's in the earlier part of John 16. The, uh, the people that Jesus sees look to him like sheep without a shepherd. And so he goes to them. There were... 5,000 men. Add the women, and we got 10,000. Add the children, and God knows how many people they have, how many mouths there are to feed. <clears throat> Jesus says to Philip, can we feed them all? It's a test. Philip says, no. Man, if we had 
a year's worth of money, we couldn't feed them all. But here comes Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. <clears throat> Andrew said, well, I don't know. Jesus, here's a kid, and, and, and he's got five barley loaves and two fish. But how many people can eat that? Jesus says, have everybody sit on the green grass. I almost think of a sort of amphitheater grass rising up to where Jesus is. <clears throat> 5,000, 10,000, more than 10,000 people. It's an amphitheater. It's a basketball game. So they all sit down. Jesus takes the barley loaves and breaks them. <clears throat> and then he himself moves among all those people distributing pieces of bread, enough so that every one of them were filled. Amazing. <clears throat> Second rung. Jesus fills us, even now, with good things. With food. Well, an abundance of food, because when the uh, people have eaten, Jesus says, to his disciples, go on out, <coughs> pick up the crumbs, save them. And when they come back, they have 12 basketfuls of crumbs. We eat well, my dear friends, and we have 12 baskets left over to give to the poor. <clears throat> oh, one more thing in this early part of the 16th chapter. Jesus identifies himself before the disciples, even if they don't get it. <clears throat> After this dinner has been served and the people have left, disciples go down to a boat. <clears throat> they push off into the Sea of Galilee, and they start rowing away. Jesus isn't with them, but about two or three miles from the shore, it's night, a wind blows up, and huge waves start rocking their boat. Can you see that boat go up the top and down, shooting into a ditch of waves? And you can imagine, <coughs> disciples are terrified. Worse, they look back behind them, and here is a light, pale little light coming toward them, up and down on the swells of the sea. Worse, when that light comes close enough, it's a man walking on the water. I don't know what they would have done, except that when that man came close to them, he said, I am. We translate it, I am he, it's Jesus. But actually, in the Greek, there are only two words, I am, ego eimi. Now you need to understand this, <clears throat> that this is the name that Isaiah gives to the Lord God. I am. Jesus is sort of allowing them to peek at his identity. He's not just a human. He is divine. But they don't get it. <clears throat> a number of years back, I took a drive from Milwaukee, 20 or 30 miles north, <clears throat> Outside of Cedarburg, I had a friend named Mel who was living, whom I hadn't seen in something like 25 years. It was October. Melvin and I had been classmates when we were freshmen at Concordia College. And this is what Mel was like. <clears throat> in those days, I'm sure it doesn't happen in these days, when Concordia College was an all-male school, some of those fellows would sneak off campus and drink beer. Not Mel. Mel was a conundrum in the class. Melvin, thin, lean fellow in those days, would have a little heating pad well, a heating ring in our room upon which he would heat water and dip Lipton tea bags in. 
my roommate drank tea. <laughs> but he, when we were, during that year, he invited me to his house <clears throat> on a dairy farm. And I loved the weekends that I was there. His mother, Gertrude, was a round-faced, strong-bodied, short, energetic and happy woman. In fact, her face would remind me <clears throat> of the sweet crust of an apple pie. She always baked bread on a Saturday night, enough for the whole week yet to come. But Saturday morning, she and I would drive in her pickup truck to the farmer's market in town. She had a large vegetable garden, and we sold the vegetables. I had trouble with the old German women who came. Kartoffeln, they'd say. Wie viel? Potatoes, how much? And I would point to the little card that said, how much per pound? <coughs> Nine, they would say. Frau Weiss, they wanted to talk to Mel's mother. Oh, and she was so sweet. She was so round. And she was so cunning <laughs> that she got more than the price when they were done. <clears throat> well, I hoped to see her as I was driving north to the farm. I got up on the front porch and knocked on the door. The door was so white in the October sun, nearly blinded me. <clears throat> Mel said, what a surprise. Walter, I haven't seen you in so many years. And I said, well, I came on a whim. He opened the door, he said, come in. And I smelled warm baked bread. I said, ah, your mother is still doing it. Mel dropped his head a little while. He wore half glasses. When I met him there, he had a white shirt on and jeans with perfect creases down either leg. He dropped his head and he said, No, I see to the necessary things now. <clears throat> Let's talk about bread for a moment. Throughout scripture, the staff of bread that means that it was the staple food for all the people in the Middle East, Egypt. It was what kept them alive. It was the most important food they had, <clears throat> however they handled it. But the poor had to eat barley bread because barley was able to grow on alkaline soil bad soil, which is where they were forced to live. On the other hand, the rich got to eat wheat bread because it grew in rich soil and needed much more tender care. Jesus, you'll remember, used five barley loaves. Oh, let us break bread together. The breaking of bread means <coughs> the sharing of it with friends, family, neighbors, eating a meal, chatting, laughing, <clears throat> enjoying the presence of one another. Maybe Sunday afternoons, I don't know. And then four, bread was the word for feast. Very important days now. People would come to feast, say, on a marriage day. <clears throat> Or on the day when the harvest was rich and good, they would gather together and feast. Or on the holy days, we call them holidays, on the holy days, they would gather, feast. And I, I, I say that because I want you to remember the words, <clears throat> a foretaste of the feast to come. Up the rung, up the rungs of the ladder. Well, in the kitchen, Mel said, come in, meet mother. 
He led me from the kitchen into the parlor of the farmhouse. To my left was a chair with a standing lamp turned down over it and a table with books on it where I, yes, Mel sat all night long. To my right was a hospital bed. It had been cranked up about 45 degrees and lying in the bed <coughs> back up <coughs> was Gertrude, Melvin's mother, but not the woman I remembered. Now her face was slack, as blank as a porcelain plate. She raised her eyes, milky blue eyes, to my hands and no higher. Mel said, Mother, be pleased to meet Walt, which was strange to me, it was so formal. But she only looked up this high and she put out her hand and I took it to shake it and it felt to me like I was holding warm dough. She didn't say anything. Melvin said, <clears throat> she's looking at your hands because she wants something to eat. He went to his sideboard <clears throat> and he broke a piece of a fresh loaf of bread and he put it in her hand. And that old woman had the most brilliant, wonderful teeth. She was chewing cheerfully as we left. Mel and I walked outside that afternoon <clears throat> and he told me his story, what had happened since we'd last seen each other. Oh, yeah, he'd only gone through the freshman year because in July of that year his father had died. He didn't come back for the sophomore year. He'd gone home to take care of the farm himself, dairy farm. So we walked in an apple grove and he told me that through the years he had to sell off the fields one by one. He had to sell off the cattle until there were no more. And now they had been reduced to five acres around the farmhouse. <coughs> and this old orchard, October, animals, I mean the apples had fallen to the ground and they were beginning to rot and to put a whiny smell on the air which I liked. I see to the necessary things, Mel said. <clears throat> we went back in at dusk. He actually took bread, toasted it, and made French bread for us for supper. We talked a little longer, and then he went into the parlor to sit with his mother all night long. And I went upstairs to the bedroom that he and I had shared when we were young together. <clears throat> the rungs of the ladder. The first rung was God's faithfulness in sending manna to the children of Israel. Manna, which became consecrated in the bread of the Passover. The second rung is that Jesus came down from heaven <coughs> to feed us, our bodies, with abundance. And so Jesus becomes our Lord. And now the third rung of the ladder. It was on the night before Jesus was hanged on a cross, Thursday night. Oh, let's see, at nine o'clock in the morning is when they hammered the nails in <clears throat> and lifted that stout pole which sunk into a hole and he was hung. That was about nine o'clock, so maybe only 12 hours before that, <clears throat> Jesus and his disciples went into an upper room and sat down to celebrate the Passover meal. Old covenant, Passover bread. But he looked at them, I can imagine Peter, 
in a tank top honking away on food. <laughs> he looked at them sadly. One of you, he said, is going to betray me. Nevertheless, he got up and he brought some bread to the table. <clears throat> and he put it down in front of them. He sat, he picked up the loaf. He blessed it, he gave thanks to God, and he broke it piece by piece by piece so that every disciple got a bite. And when they did, he said the last words of our lesson, this is my body, broken for you. This is my flesh. Do this always in remembrance of me. I don't think Peter was gnawing on a bone anymore. This is very curious and very sad. <coughs> then Jesus got up again. And perhaps from a sideboard, he brought a cup of wine. He blessed it. And then he gave it to all of them that they should each have a drink. And he changed everything. No longer the old covenant, the old testament. He said to the disciples, this is the new covenant, the new testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for all. That's us. That's us. We're at the table. For the forgiveness of sins. And this too, Jesus said, do this in the remembrance of Well, they did. All their lives they did. And our ancestors did. And we do. And here is the fourth rung. Jesus says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. <clears throat> Listen, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it weren't so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And when I go and prepare that place for you all, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. Fourth rung. We're at the foot of heaven. Even now, we eat, we drink, and we are at the foot of heaven. Well, at about three in the morning, a kind of a wailing woke me up, and I sat up in bed. Yeah, na, 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 yeah, I heard downstairs. And at first I thought it might have been a cat. <clears throat> but Mel had no cat, and after all, that was not the voice that a cat would use. In fact, it sounded like a human. I got up, <clears throat> and I shot down the stairs. In the kitchen, there were no lights. There were no lights at all. But there was a meek, weak little light coming between the door and the jam of the parlor. Without a thought, I opened it up. There to my left, was Mel's chair, empty, that little light, that was the only source of light, that lamp, that standing lamp. To my right was the hospital bed. And as soon as I entered that room, I knew what Mel was doing. He was kneeling beside his mother. <clears throat> he was washing her waist away. He was folding one dirty diaper. and is preparing a clean one. Oh, and the man was singing for his mother in German, <coughs> a nighttime gentle lullaby hymn. Müde bin ich geht zu Ruhe, 
Vater, mach die Augen zu. And then I knew what Gertrude was doing too. Ja, na, 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 na. She was singing along. Och, she was a child again. She was that little girl running across the green fields, dressed in her Easter best, a bonnet and ribbons blowing behind her, her arms spread out with pure joy, and over the hill, just over the hill, she was halfway to heaven. <laughs>